to the nature of the program, save your thoughts. We'd all be glad to talk to you afterwards, believe me. The second number, the Albanoni number, has kind of a strange genesis. The composer is really the second name, Gaizato. He's a contemporary Italian. He claimed to have found this little fragment of a number by Tommaso Albanoni, who we don't have a whole lot of music from. And so he, quote, expanded on it and made this number out of it. But when they actually asked to see the fragment, it didn't exist. <laughs> Couldn't find it. Who knows what happened? So we think the number is actually his number. Um, this number is actually written for organ and strings, and this is the organ-only version of it. It's interesting. It's a very nice number. And if you ever have a chance to hear it with strings, too, uh, it's quite worthwhile.
In the next number, uh, the Bach number, it's usually translated as O Lamb of God Unspotted. And that's how it was in the LBW hymnal. In this, it's relatively straightforward piece. You have on the keyboards two voices that accompany the hymn melody, which is played on the pedals with the feet, except for one thing. There's a third voice in the keyboard. And as I've told the choir numerous times, one of the devices used by composers is called canon. Now, when you were in school, you sang, row, row, row your boat gently down the street, and the second voice came in, the other side of the classroom or something. That was a round. Now, <coughs> a canon works the same way, only it's very strict. Whatever you do in the first voice, you must do in the second voice. And you can have three, four, five, and six different voices that repeat what the first one does. And it's quite a task to come up with this sometimes. Um, in this one, Bach does not play the second melody line at the same pitch. He takes it and puts it up five steps away and repeats exactly what happened in the first. And it still makes music. Canons were sort of the uh, show-off mental exercise of the times. They've been done since uh, the 1300s. And composers used to, um, when they visited other composers, if you remember in the 1880s to the, oh, 1910 or so, when you went to visit somebody, you took and you had a calling card with your name on it. And you went to their house, and if they had a butler or somebody, he took your calling card, and he went to the master of the house. And if the master wanted to see you, he would see you. If he didn't, he would say, tell them I can't see them this week, I can see them some other time. Well, anyway, composers used to do this as their calling card. And for some composers, we have some of these because they're very cleverly worked out. Bach was an absolute master at this. In some pieces he has, um, he will have um, a melody line start, and for the, the different segments of the piece, he'll have the melody, the, the canon line start two notes away, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. There's even one where one group of people starts here, the other people start at the end and work backwards, and it still makes music. It's one of those things, either you have it or you don't. <laughs> right? So in, in this relatively simple piece, though, Bach puts this, and since a canon follows the first voice, usually in the words of the hymn somewhere, you will find something about following Jesus, following the Lord. Uh, there's a famous one, um, I think it's just before Epiphany, where it says, we follow in your footsteps. And there's a canon in it, if you look hard enough and find it. So that, that was the purpose of this. And I think that's probably in one of these verses there is something about that.
in the Dupre Stations of the Cross. The Stations of the Cross is a prayer office in the Catholic Church, and it's especially popular in Lent, although it is prayed all year round. In this series of writings, um, it came about at a concert in Brussels, and there's a French writer by the name of Paul Claudel, and he wrote his own interpretation of the various stations. There are 14 stations of the cross. This deals with from the time Christ is condemned until he is risen from the cross. And there are 14 different milestones along the way. And you've heard of people in the Mideast walking the way of the cross. And that's where the different things supposedly happen. After Paul Claudel read his version of the Stations of the Cross, Dupre improvised on how he felt the interpretation of this was. And this is the results of it. Uh, there are 14 stations here. God gives gifts to musicians in different ways. Dupre was an excellent improviser. He played this whole piece. It's the art of instant music, if you don't know what improvisation is. It's just you go and you make it up as you go along. And some people are so gifted at this, you think, surely it's printed. Well, it, it didn't have to be for him. He did not bother writing this down until several years later. How he remembered it, I have no idea. The section I'm going to play, um, it's not quite like what your bulletin says. It's Jesus comforts the women of Jerusalem, not confronts. And I think just a slightly different feeling to the time. Um, as Jesus was on the cross, the women gather around and Jesus has words with them. And this piece is meant to imply the feelings of what went on at that time.
Charles Callahan is a contemporary composer. He works in Washington, D.C. at the moment. I heard him a couple years ago in Uniontown. He did a dedication concert of an instrument there. And I told him that I played some of his music, and he said, which one? And I told him this piece, this aria, is originally for organ, and he arranged it for viola and organ. And I told him that I played this, and he laughed and chuckled, and he said, it isn't as innocent as it looks, is it? And I said, no, it definitely isn't. It's much harder than you th what appears on the paper. It goes in ways you kind of don't expect it to go. So I thought that was an interesting comment coming from the composer himself. At least he was aware of what he was doing. Um, this transcription was made just a couple of years ago. And um, I know you don't know your pastor played. And um, he didn't just pick it up for this concert, believe me. <laughs> so uh, you'll hear something. You don't often get to hear viola and organ together. It's not a, a, a usual combination. And it's one that I think works particularly well.
happen to like the music of Siegfried Cargeller. Um, it's sort of out of style, but it has a lot to say to it. Um, he was the product of a Lutheran father and a Catholic mother. And when he composed, he, compl he said he had his Lutheran and Catholic side. These are out of 66 chorales that were meant came out of the Lutheran Church. And in this one, Blessed Jesus, what law hast thou broken? Uh, he captures, I think, the hymn very well. And one thing to note, the very last chord of the piece has no third in it. The third determines whether it's major or minor. And in this last, the last chord, it will sound very hollow and empty. I think it's sort of like the tomb. At the end of all this, the tomb was empty. And that's what this last chord, I think, signifies. Thank mm -hmm. you. 